I talked a lot about methodologies yesterday. I'm gonna talk more about results today and what the implications are. Essentially, I'm not gonna answer the question of my talk, but I will tell you it's a lot. Um, and how do we get to finding out the, the, the better details? Historically, when we look at the control of locomotion, there's been a tripartite analysis where we know that reflexes are very involved, and this goes back to the early work from Sherrington. Um, we also know that spinal neural networks are involved, whether they're central pattern generators or some related neural network. We know that in humans they control a great deal of the muscle activation patterns, um, and that goes back to some of the earlier work by a number of people, um, including some groundbreaking work by Grillner, Edgerton, Rossignol. Um, for the brain, it's been less um, known exactly how much the human brain is involved in locomotion. There's some really good work by Trevor Drew and colleagues uh, here in Montreal looking at cats and how different parts of the brain are involved in the control of locomotion. But generally, we don't have many ways to look at it for humans. Being from Florida, of course, I try to plug the mouse whenever I can. But when we go out and do real world activities, we walk in many different ways. We may be walking with a little pep in our step that the gait changes a little bit. We may even close our eyes when we're walking, whistle a tune. There's lots of cognitive tasks that we can carry on when we're walking. Um, and that's gonna change the relative balance between how much our brain is involved and how much it isn't. And really, we need a better way to examine that. Uh, back around 2008, I went to go work with Scott McKay at UC San Diego and Klaus Grauman, who was this postdoc then. And we started trying to measure brain activity with EEG, high-density EEG. And some of this is some of the first work that we published in 2010 in a couple of papers. And the essential idea was, let's take a very simple cognitive task that is showing people an X or a plus. And sometimes it's called the visual oddball test. You show them a lot of pluses, then occasionally you show them an X. What happens in their brain? And we know from uh, subjects that are sitting down and looking at a computer screen that there's a very stereotypical event-related potential that you can record from certain electrodes on the scalp. And given the advances in some of the hardware and the advances in the software and the signal processing, we wanted to see if this would be possible not only while you're standing, but while you're walking and while you're running. And essentially, I'm gonna summarize the results here. Um, this is the data from standing. This is the X, the oddball, when the target appears. About 100 milliseconds later, this is a topo plot showing you how the electrodes are changing for a given independent component after we use ICA. And essentially what this is saying is there's a part in the brain, um, that's the nose, that's the left ear, that's the right ear. There's a part in the brain somewhere down in this area that is producing changes in electrical potentials um, that can be recorded with electrodes in certain areas, okay? That's a stereotypical visual cortex um, response. This is a frontal lobe, uh, 150 millisecond strong response. This is anterior cingulate, which usually shows a change in electrical potential at about 400 milliseconds. This, for sitting, looks the same as standing. There's no difference. What happens when we go to walking? Lo and behold, after we use some of our um, novel signal processing and cleaning algorithms, we can get essentially the same result. So if you look from this row to this row, there's not qualitatively much difference in how we're evaluating the brain activity. The same could be said of running. So using some of the signal processing we developed, um, we're actually getting very similar responses at same time periods from the same independent components or the sources within the head. So this was a good first step for us. It convinced us that, hey, maybe we can go farther than we thought, because I still remember the conversation with Scott McCaig when uh, he and I started talking. I wanted to study walking and locomotion, and he wanted to basically um, add in all these objects to stand and stop and point to places. And I thought that was good, but it's not what I wanted to know. I wanted to know just walking straight ahead, doing nothing. Um, and we tried it for one day in a very small room without much success because everybody was getting tangled up in the wires. 
So that night I went to Sears at the local mall, bought a treadmill, dropped it off at his lab at midnight. The next morning we came in to collect again and he's like, what's that? And I'm like, that's our treadmill. We're gonna study locomotion on a treadmill. And that's how we got going towards looking at steady state locomotion. I'm not gonna go into much detail with the methods, but I will make a very strong push that I think you can't just put EEG electrodes on somebody's head and have them walk or run and say, oh, here's the data. You've got to do a really good job of validating what you do. If you can't demonstrate that what you're getting is really um, ground truth, then you're really unsure of how well that actually reflects what's going on in the head. So over the last few years, we've developed our own electrical head phantoms. This is one with a bionic brain and uh, dental plaster and salt. This is one with a bionic brain and a mix of uh, ballistics gel and salt. And with these, we can send whatever brain signals we want through to the antenna that are embedded inside the head. And then we can actually put our EEG systems on and record and see how well we can actually reproduce the ground truth. And of course, you need the motion. So we got a really nice uh, French made a uh, hexapod uh, that can do six degree of freedom motion. We put inertial measurement units on people's head to record how their head actually moves when they walk and run. We then replay that through our motion platform, send various signals through. This is eight channels, time series of different electrodes. You can see that it's fairly noisy. The periods in between the signals are very uh, large in amplitude and um, uh, looks like background noise. On the other hand, after we do our processing with our novel hardware and signal processing, we actually get a much, much cleaner signal. Um, and we've used this to validate and to convince ourselves that what we're getting is real. Um, we also go looking for those ground truth signals. So in one given antenna inside the phantom head, we broadcast different types of signals that are overlapping at different frequencies. And then we go back and say, can we reproduce what that signal looks like? and the cross-correlations are greater than 0.9. So we have a pretty good grasp on what we can and can't do at this point. One of the first things we were interested in is dual tasking. Uh, if you're familiar with the aging research, you know that as people get older, they have a harder time dual tasking. From my own background, I had worked at UCLA in the Department of Neurology on spinal cord injury rehabilitation. For individuals who have an incomplete spinal cord injury, you can put them in a modified parachute harness, suspend them over a treadmill, assist them to take steps on a treadmill, and 75% roughly incomplete spinal cord injury patients that are Asia C and D can get back to walking. So that's a pretty good number, um, but they definitely have a hard time dual tasking. When you give them concurrent mental tasks, they have a hard time walking and talking and um, using their cell phone at the same time. So we really wanted to see how dual tasking affects uh, brain activity. You see it all the time. If you go out around campus, you'll see people talking and looking around um, while they're walking. Of course, more li likely, you'll see a lot of undergraduates with their phones that are texting, which again is another real world dual tasking with high ecological validity. Um, you can go out to a new city and have to navigate places that you haven't been before, go up and down stairs, not navigate obstacles. Or if you go really far away, maybe you have to use a map and figure out where you're going and, and dual task again as well across terrain that you're not used to navigating. So we tried to design something in the lab that was a fairly difficult cognitive task. Not a simple one, but something that was really challenging. Um, and the idea was we know that for physical health, there's a trend to adopt standing desks as well as walking desks. Can you? Um, work on your desk and walk at the same time to have a general state of health. But we were curious, is, is this really going to affect your cognitive behavior? If you're trying to get something done, are you gonna make cognitive errors because you're walking while you're working? Um, and so we thought that one way to do this, um, actually I'll go back. Um, one way to do this would be to have a difficult cognitive task and walk at your desk. Um, the problem we had is biomechanists, as we know that there's a preferred walking speed. When you walked from the poster session to here, you walked at a given speed. And many of the cognitive dual tasking studies 
don't control the speed. They let the individual adjust their own speed, which is a confounding factor because speed may affect what's going on. And then also as a biomechanist, we understood that there is a preferred walking speed that you actually use the least amount of energy per mile that you walk. We call it the cost of transport, and it's minimum at your, about your preferred walking speed. This actually relates to your natural dynamics. Humans move like inverted pendulums, um, and we have a natural motion to our gait. Tad McGeer, who was a professor at Simon Fraser University many years ago, shown here, um, built on some work by Tom McMahon at Harvard University to show you can actually build passive dynamic systems that will walk downhill. There's no motors, there's no sensors, it's just a series of rigid rods and um, uh, links that allow it to take steps. And the natural pendular shape of the walking motion allows the energy to come from walking downhill. Um, there are certain frequencies and speeds that are natural for this. And it's believed that because humans have a similar geometry, we have this natural pendular gait that reduces our energy costs when we walk over distance. And so some of the first work was shown by um, Ralston in 1958. But if you look at cost of transport here on the y-axis, so much energy you're using per meter covered, per kilogram of your weight, versus your walking speed, there is this minimal, it's a U-shaped form, that about your preferred walking speed, you use the least amount of energy. If you walk a mile a little bit slower or a little bit faster, you burn more calories. So if there's this natural pendular motion our body wants to take, we were really curious if we measured cognitive performance walking at different speeds, would we actually show the best cognitive performance at your preferred speed if that's the natural mechanics that your body wants to take, maybe it uses the least amount of mental attention to move you that distance. So we set up what is known as a Brooks Spatial Working Memory task. Essentially, uh, imagine a three by three grid that looks like a tic-tac-toe board. And then while subjects are walking, we um, display there is a one in the top left then that goes away and you have to remember that the one is in the top left. There is a nine in the bottom middle and you have to remember the nine in the bottom middle. And it keeps going till all of the grid is full and then you are told to respond and then you have a um, handheld interface, it's much like a texting on a phone, where you have to play back the numbers from top to uh, left to bottom right in rows all the way through. It's a very difficult task to do. Actually, typically you only get about 50% success rate in getting each number correct. So it's not something that's fairly easy. You have to devote a lot of mental attention. But then we looked at healthy young subjects, again, because we wanted to see best case scenario. Um, do you actually perform better at your preferred walking speed and a little bit worse at slower speeds or faster speeds? And then at the same time, we used our EEG techniques to actually look at are you devoting devoting more or less mental resources to the task. So first off was the biomechanics. Um, one of the, uh, one um, accepted measure of your stability during gait is that you look at the step width or the step width variability, either one, and essentially what it does is it lets you say, if I am in a situation where I'm unstable, if you're walking on ice, people tend to adopt a gait that's a little bit wider it helps to increase their mechanical stability. And so what we found is that for all the speeds tested from a slow walk, 0.4 meters per second, through your preferred walking speed, through a fast walk, you walked with a little bit wider steps with the cognitive task than without, and it was significant. Essentially, you are adjusting for the cognitive task. You are finding a way to change your mechanics. That was good. We are hoping for some effect to the cognitive task. But when we actually look at the performance across the speed, so again, we have standing here on the left, uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 1.2, 1.6, .1 and we look at the percent correct, there was no significant difference in the percent correct. There was variation between subjects, some people were good at it, some people were not, but overall there was no effect between standing and walking on the cognitive ability to get this task correct. 
which was a little disappointing to us, but nonetheless, you take the results as they come in science. Um, and then we looked at our EEG to try to figure out, number one, what parts of your brain are you devoting to this mental task? And lo and behold, um, if you were at my talk yesterday, you'll understand that this top series are small spheres. Every single one of these colored spheres is an independent component or a source of electrical activity that we've recorded and identified with our EEG. And then down below are the mean locations for each cluster. And essentially what this does is it groups all of the purple small spheres for all 20 subjects into one location so we can look at the general area that this is. And it's based on location, spectral properties, um, trying to cluster them. For every area that we looked at per involved in performing this mental task, we essentially got the same result, which is that the spectral power fluctuations were not affected by speed. So on the x-axis is my time, with 0% is the respond time point. So this is when they're um, receiving numbers and they're um, trying to remember, remember them. This is when you're actually trying to recall the numbers and input them. Regardless of what brain area we look at and what statistical analysis we did, there's essentially from um, standing to fast walking, there was no change in the spectral power. So they were devoting the same mental attention resources to the task, regardless of speed, and their success rate was no different. So not only does what this suggests is that standing, uh, walking at your desk seems to be fine from a cognitive standpoint, but there's a trend going in, in boardrooms around the US, I'm not sure of Canada, of having walking meetings. So instead of sitting around a table and talking, why not walk the hallways of your, or walk outside and still have your meeting, but at least you get a little exercise. Um, and given our study, which shows that when you're looking at difficult cognitive tasks, speed doesn't matter, it's standing or walking, it's all the same. Um, and there's another study actually out of Stanford that came out the same year which suggests that walking may even increase creativity. And if that's true, you're getting a little bit boost in creativity, you're not affecting your cognitive ability, then I would definitely say go with your walking meetings because there's the potential to have benefit um, without a lot of negative consequences. Okay, so again, back to my Florida roots. Many of you may recognize this person. If you know who this is, raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. Shaquille O'Neal, professional basketball player, used to be. Uh, he started his career professionally at the Orlando Magic. He's gotten a little older these days, and it's actually not that hard to go on YouTube, type in Shaq falling, and find lots of videos. This is one, but there are many. <laughs> um, and this, is a, this sort of reflects what we, have, what we know about society. As we get older, falls tend to increase. As a biomechanist, I'm really curious as to what the cause is um, from a mechanistic standpoint. Is it that the muscles are too weak? Is it that you just don't sense you're losing your balance till you're too late? Or is it maybe you sense it, but you can't do the cognition and the calculations to figure out how to save yourself in time? The only way really to answer that question is to have tools that allow you to see inside somebody's head to identify when they know they lost their balance. Because then you can look at the loss of balance, when they register it inside their head, what parts of their brain are involved, when they respond mechanically so that you can see, is it a delayed response or is it a delayed um, uh, identification of the problem? So it turns out IRBs don't like it when you say you want to study old people falling. We had to explain to them that it's falling isn't the problem, it's landing is the problem. So we had to come up with a way to study falling, but very safe landing. And we started off looking at young, healthy subjects. But this was um, the idea. Essentially, what it is is um, a balance beam mounted on a treadmill that goes forever. So it's only one inch tall. It's only one inch tall, um, but it allows you to keep walking while we can measure your brain dynamics. And one of the interesting things about this is my grad student that came up with the idea is it really allows us to look at self-initiated falls because we think there's a fundamental difference, or there may be, 
between triggered falls if we externally perturbate you versus um, you trying to do a task and falling on your own. So what this intervention allows us to do is study people while they're trying to balance and as they step off but they just can't maintain it on their own. Um, we, in this particular instance, we have subjects crossing their arms because we figured out that if we don't, if we allow you to have free arm, that you're really good at doing lots of cool things to prolong the fall. That doesn't make it as clean of an experiment. So in this, we studied 20 young subjects walking, trying to figure out how far in advance does your brain actually know you're losing your balance and what parts of your brain are involved. Here are my um, independent component sources. And essentially what you can see from the large number of uh, different clusters that are pictured, these are individual subjects, these small spheres, and then that's the mean. Number one take home message, a lot of your brain cares about you falling, okay? It's not just sensory motor. It's not anterior cingulate plus sensory motor. There's a lot of different brain areas, prefrontal, posterior parietal cortex, um, somatosensory that are all involved in identifying what's going on and responding. We can calculate event-related spectral per perturbation graphs, which are essentially, we call them ERSPs. They have frequency content on the y-axis, and then when they have time on the x-axis, but the time is warped. In this case, we're warping it to these time events, beam contact, beam contact, treadmill contact, treadmill contact. So between BC and TC is when they've stepped off. We're looking at the right sensory motor and the left sensory motor clusters for all the subjects. And we're trying to identify what part of your brain first realizes you lose your balance and how far in advance. And lo and behold, it turns out for all of our right-handed subjects and right-footed subjects, it was the left sensory motor cortex, um, which comes on about a second before you actually step off the balance beam, which is quite a long time. And you'll notice it's triggered by having both feet on the ground. So this vertical black line here is when your left foot, for instance, touches the front balance beam, you know your right foot is not gonna make it to the, on the balance beam, okay? Um, which actually makes a lot of sense when you stop and think about what we know about internal models and balance, is that when you have two feet on the balance beam, we know that there's a little bit of sensor noise in using the proprioception of my knee and my ankle and my hip to calculate where my center of mass is relative to the ground. But when I have two feet on the ground, I have two calculations I can make for my center of mass relative to the ground, and you're much better at being accurate about where your center of mass is. The same thing happens if you ever try to balance on one foot and you close your eyes. If you touch an object very lightly, it's not that mechanical force that has such a huge impact on your balance, it's you have a frame of reference using your arm where your torso is that allows you to calculate and be steadier. So this actually models or matches our data, what we know about balance quite well. Um, and so it got us to thinking, if you know the literature on stroke rehab, there are a couple of papers that have suggested um, that you're actually better off blindfolding stroke subjects for some of their rehab. Not all of their rehab, but it takes away their visual feedback and it makes them focus on their proprioception, their sense of body. And the idea is if you have to focus on it, you're better at sensing it. You have to remember that in stroke, um, like in complete spinal cord injury, it's not just a motor problem, it's a sensory problem. You don't get as much information back accurately about your body. And so by blindfolding them, you're forcing them to realize their body sense a little bit more. So we wanted to say, is there some uh, neural mechanism that would suggest if I blindfold you, you're better at sensing your body position? So we had our young, healthy subjects um, walk on a treadmill with eyes open and eyes closed. And here's our ERSPs, again, frequency content on the y-axis. Um, time on the x-axis, we have right heel strike, left toe off, left heel strike, right toe off, right heel strike, with eyes open and eyes closed. And you'll notice that there's much greater theta and alpha synchronization in the somatosensory cortex for eyes closed than eyes open. And you'll notice when does it occur? Again, it occurs at double support when you have more sensory information about where your body is because you have two feet on the ground. So this matches with all the theory. 
and we thought maybe there's a way we could use this to actually design an intervention to actually improve motor learning. So there's lots of examples in rehabilitation where you want to improve motor learning, uh, stroke rehab, spinal cord injury rehab, traumatic brain injury, but there are also examples in sports where you want to train people motor skills and get them to learn faster. So could you do an intervention that actually enhances the rate that you learn? So one of my students, uh, Steve Peterson, um, decided that what he could try to do is instead of blindfolding them, could he do a much shorter controlled variation in your vision? So rather than taking away your vision completely, which can be unsafe, can he do a short perturbation to your vision? And so what he decided to do was have subjects do the balance beam training while they were in a virtual reality, but their virtual reality was real re reality. So basically you put a camera outside the Oculus Rift that filmed what you saw and then played it back. So you're seeing exactly what you normally see, but he could now control your display. So he could introduce perturbations. And the perturbation that he decided to try was just a sh very brief rotation of the way that you see the world. And when you do this brief rotation, you give them a short perturbation that lasts half a second, what happens? Um, up top is our individual, independent components related to the perturbation. Down below, instead of showing you the mean cluster like we've done, this was a study where we actually did a region of interest analysis where you force all of your independent components into different brain regions. And we compared how well they did with perturbations and without perturbations. And essentially what you see is that with the perturbations and without the perturbations, it was brief enough it didn't change how many errors they made, which is a really important thing we tried to match. But when you look at how well they got better, we found that without perturbations, you got about 10% better after training for half an hour. But with the perturbations, you got over 43% better. So you're actually getting a three-fold increase on how well you're improving with a brief perturbation. So we think what's happening is that when you look at the data of the different brain regions, the parietal region is very involved in planning your motor um, uh, responses and especially dealing with perturbations. When you look at the ERSP of the frequency versus time, you see that with the first perturbation, you see an increase in spectral power, then a desynchronization that comes at a little bit higher beta frequency, and then you go back at the second, the 0.5 is when the perturbation stops and you see a sort of reverse effect, but it's priming the parietal cortex in a way that we think is enhancing that motor learning experience. So we wanted to know if this was true of all perturbations. Could it happen for visual as well as physical? So we designed another experiment whoops, with subjects that were not only the, doing their visual rotation perturbation, but they also did a physical perturbation. So it basically pulled them for a brief pulse to one side or the other. With the idea, it's a perturbation, does your brain react the same way? Up top, you can, again, many areas of the brain are involved in this problem. It's not just sensory motor cortex. You can see the mean locations down below. On the right are the different brain areas, occipital, left and right, posterior parietal, interior parietal, left sensory motor, right sensory motor, supplementary motor area, and anterior cingulate. This is the response to that visual rotation, and what do you see the strong resp responses in? Parietal cortex and occipital, which makes sense. It's a visual uh, perturbation. Your occipital should be showing responses but you actually don't see that much of a response in the sensory motor or the anterior cingulate or the supplementary motor. It's generally tend to um, isolated more towards parietal and occipital. The physical problem actually leads to a um, much different response. You see supplementary motor area, right and left sensory motor and anterior cingulate responding as well as a little more anterior parietal. But you don't see the responses in occipital as strong or the parietal. So you see a much stronger response in what's going on for the body position sense. So I guess my take home message is this, is there are many uh, reviews of the neural control of human locomotion and they're focused on many of the basal ganglia and brainstem. 
and then, oh, maybe sensory motor cortex. But there's lots of your brain that is actually involved. So um, we need to get out of the mindset that it's just sensory motor cortex. Um, one obvious implication for this, I think, is freezing gait in Parkinson's. I think we're in a situation where we can do a much better job with movement disorders, identifying what the cause is, and identifying differences between patients for diagnosis. Okay, so take home message. Um, I think the technology is getting much better. We need to push it forward. We need to validate what we're doing. Because if we are going to get to the point of having an Iron Man helmet that allows us to control a robotic exoskeleton suit, or if we're going to get to the point of Professor Xavier having a uh, brain-machine interface that allows him to talk to other, other individuals and interface with his computer that's non-invasive, I think we need to keep getting more people moving forward. And the only way we're going to do this is to get more researchers involved. Um, with that in mind, I want to thank the people that did the work and point out Andrew Norton is a research scientist in my lab who's Canadian, who's looking for a faculty job. So if you know of any, let me know. <laughs> and thank you for listening. <laughs>